I wanted to spend a little time and elaborate on this concept that I talked about in a previous mini lesson about playing tight. I think we often make the trumpet a lot more challenging than it should be. So stay tuned to this video and I'll fill you in on some more tips that hopefully will help your playing. Stay tuned. everybody, it's Trent Austin from Austin Custom Brass. I hope you're doing well. Thanks again for your great support of the shop. Please take a moment, hit that subscribe button because we really appreciate your support. Um, it's funny, I was practicing yesterday um, and doing my typical routine like I do every day, which consists of long tones, Clark studies, and Arbin. And during the Arbin stuff, I was realizing that I was moving so incredibly much. I wanted to talk and revisit this concept of playing tight. I think maybe because when we were young and we were struggling on the instrument, it took a lot of effort for us to play intervals. Um, and if you know, like the section that I'm, I mean, this happens everywhere. I felt it on almost every example I was playing yesterday. So I really slowed my practice down which is a great thing, by the way, and try to make it as small of a difference in terms of the motion I've used in my embouchure to play. And I'm gonna show you a little example. For instance, um, one of the things that people play often in the Arbin's book is that section on uh, intervals, page 125. I'm pretty sure it's page 125, depending on your Arbin book. Hopefully many of you out there know that. Um, what I was doing yesterday was, it felt like I was chewing gum and I had a teacher in Maine when I grew up. I was very fortunate to have great instructors even in a small town of Maine. Um, uh, and he said to me, he's like, man, it looks like you're chewing gum. Why are you moving so much? And I was like, well, it's challenging. You know, this is coming from the 12, 13 year old me. Um, and he goes, don't move. And I was like, you, if, you, if you don't move, you can't play it. And he goes, try it. He goes, put yourself in a mirror and try to eliminate the motion. So one thing that he gave me was a bending exercise, and I didn't really know how to do this back when I was 13 years old. It was then later elaborated for me by the great Stephen Burns, who is an amazing teacher in the Chicago area. Anybody who's in Chicago definitely needs to get in touch with St Stephen Burns. He's incredible. Um, but for instance, If we conscientiously think about not moving, yes, the horn does move, of course. And I use a lot of the elements of my embouchure pivot um, via Reinhardt. So I move because it actually decreases the amount of stress on my embouchure. But we don't have to go woo woo. We can go. You physically try to make it as small as possible. Here's a great exercise for that, especially in lip slurs. Check this out. So as opposed to doing a normal lip slur, which I'll do right now for you. Right? I shrink that. And I bend into the note. So it's gonna go and it's just gonna snap. This is similar to the Thompson book, I think, where he does those glissandos. Once I get it to the point where it's almost zero motion, I try to do the slur then. And the 
concept still applies. So I can do things like this, which I think this might be in John Daniel's book, the special studies book. It's like one of the only books actually we sell on, at the shop. One thing I always add is a large leap at the end uh, that is trying to tell my brain that I don't have to move as much. Again, I always go back to the analogy of the piano keyboard. The amount of effort it takes on a low note versus the amount of effort it takes on a high note is the same. I mean, the, it's why does it have to be different on the trumpet? Someone needs to explain to me. It actually can be easier to play a a high note, but we have to really focus on the, the smallest of motions to make that happen. So check this out. Again, at the end of these, you can just jump up. We're shrinking the motion. And you could do this, check it out. Every single exercise you play will often use incredibly excessive motion, like Clark Three, for instance. This, this first way is the, for me, is an incorrect way of playing, and I wanna show you the chops. This is the way I would want to play this, which is thinking much more on a flat, linear plane. Yes, you have to adjust, but it can be the most subtle adjustment that no one knows. And occasionally, I throw in something vastly different. Flexus, John McNeil's Flexus book, does do exercises in octave displacement, which you all should check out. This will help. But even on something like at the beginning of the Arbens, I can't remember the exact page number on this one. I'm thinking it's something like 22. If you shrink those octave leaps, and that's part of the brilliance of the Arbon book, is that he throws those things in and you don't really notice that you're doing them. And then you're like, oh, if you could shrink those leaps, your efficiency will dramatically increase. I think a lot of it is when we were young, especially in those books, those were some of the first books we ever used, right? So we have this puffy and loose embouchure. I do not want a puffy and loose embouchure. I want a compressed and tight embouchure. That is my concept of tight, is the compression and the, the shrinking of motion between intervals. It's a 10 to 20% increase in efficiency in my own personal playing. I still have to check myself all the time. Like I did uh, yesterday, I was like, oh man, it's so easy to slip into inefficient habits because we're just, oh, I'll just, it's it, that, that's easy. You know, there is no easy, there is no hard. There is familiar and unfamiliar. So if you're familiar with playing inefficiently, you need to get familiar with playing efficiently. I hope that clarifies this subject just a little bit. Uh, if you have additional questions, post them in the comments. We appreciate you so much. Hit that subscribe button, stay up to date with us, and um, keep on keeping on. Play tight. Cheers.